We are live. Very good evening, everyone. Welcome to iFocus Online Lecture 262, number three in our UVA module. Today we have with us Dr. S. Bala Murugan sir from Arvind Eye Hospital, Pondicherry, uh, who will be talking to us on uh, history taking in uveitis patient. Uh, I invite Amod Gupta sir to please introduce uh, sir to our audience. Well, friends, uh, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Bala Murugan. He's a senior consultant. Uh, in the uveitis uh, group at Arvind Eye Care Hospital uh, from Madurai. And uh, I think he's going to be talking to us and sharing the experiences of history taking, I think which is a very, very vital component of the workup of uveitis patients. And uh, we are all looking forward to hearing Dr. Bala uh, on this very important topic, uh, the third online uveitis lecture. Uh, this Friday. Dr. Balamurku, please go ahead. Good evening, sir. Thank you for your kind words. Good evening, one and all. Is my voice and slides visible? Yes, sir. Perfectly. Yes. Thank you. <coughs> so, uh, at the outset, I would like to thank profusely the uh, organizers of iFocus, Dr. Santosh Shanova, and the entire team, as well as the senior moderators and the people in the hot seat for uh, bearing, uh, for having reposed so much faith in me to handle this such an important topic on history taking in UV. This I will touch a few of pointers on systemic evaluation. We have a next talk on ocular evaluation. So the minimal systemic evaluation, I will try to give a overview. Uh, so let me start uh, my presentation. So when we get into any temple, first thing we do is pay our uh, sincere prayers to Lord Ganesha. So similarly, uh, when we start doing any examination in the eye, the most important element is to pay attention to the complaints of the patient and ask the relevant history. So uh, we may be very uh, senior experts in uh, doing a proper evaluation, doing uh, ultra-modern investigations, unless we pay special attention to the patient complaints and try to correlate with what is relevant to the patient's perspective, our approach is going to be entirely different as we see in the course of this presentation. So we, we all know that uh, history repeats itself because nobody listens the first time. And it, uh, those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat the mistakes again and again. This all, we all know that. But anamnesis is the other name for history taking is a forgotten flowers uh, order that is left in a magical garden. So William Osler actually said that it is much more important to know what sort of a patient has a disease than what sort of a disease the patient has. It has got a lot of deeper meanings which we need to apply in a real time practice. I uh, sincerely learned the art of history taking from my mentor, Dr. Ratnam, when he did me fellowship with Aravind Madurai. And we published this work of uh, clinical workup in UVA this in the AOS module. You can see uh, the quarters and uh, the key takeaway from that is the elaborate history taking this is a cornerstone in the management of the case of UVA. It has been estimated that 75% or even more than that, actually Steve Foster says 84% of the ocular diagnosis can be made by meticulous proper history taking and applying those elements in the systemic evaluation. The key element here is we need to look beyond the eye. We need to be a good clinician to correlate the problems in the eye to the problems in the body system. So th there are two basic rules in UATS which I learned from a mentor. Let me uh, state that in the beginning. The first thing is meticulous history taking is a prerequisite to reach the correct clinical diagnosis and plan the correct treatment. 
the element added are correct diagnosis and correct treatment. And the rule number two is very simple. Never forget the rule number one. So such is the importance of history taking to uh, proceed anything, whatever we do with relevance to the patient care. So let me start with the types of anamnesis. Actually, uh, I was surprised to know that there are two types of anamnesis, prospective as well as introspective. Before reaching a clinical diagnosis or a set of differential diagnosis, like any patient who walks into our clinic, we ask a set of detailed history based on the folders. And with now EMRs, we have a set of questionnaires available. And that is a typical prospective anamnesis. The retrospective anamnesis comes into play if you have missed out some of the elements after we reach a clinical diagnosis pertinent to the differential diagnosis, it gives us one more chance so that uh, we uh, do the best part of, of the treatment care. So uh, let us look at the pros and cons of the first type, that is prospective anamnesis. As we said, that is a classical approach. It demands a long contact time with the clinician. With the COVID and the 2020, a lot was difficult in doing prospective anamnesis. And sometimes it's misleading when you ask lots and lots of questions. And uh, the problem is when a patient has an acute disease, sometimes they get fed up. They uh, seem to feel that why this doctor keeps on asking without doing any proper examination per se before uh, uh, touching the patient. We keep on asking so many acute, uh, an acute condition, they get sometimes fed up. Whereas in a chronic disease, the, the, some people uh, get uh, appreciation because nobody has listened to the problem earlier and sometimes they, it builds, builds a lot of confidence upon the clinician. So uh, in a rural setting, again, uh, these long-run problems are forgotten and they don't have any documentation as well. Whereas in an urban educated scenario, careful documentation of information is superfluous and sometimes it is the duty of the clinician to pinpoint the needle in a haystack. So it really needs an arc uh, so, so that we do the best part of our treatment care. Whereas the retrospective anamnesis is relevant to the focus clinical and working diagnosis. As I said, it covers up the lacrimy, whatever we have done. It can be repeated during the follow-up and it helps to filter out the signal from the noise. We can ask the relevant questions relevant to the differentials we have uh, established. So the relevant uh, probing uh, of the history of recurrent conditions, aggravating factors, precipitating factors can be asked in detail. What caused actually a problem? For example, if a patient has a zoster ophthalmicus causing a keratouveitis, non granulomatous uveitis with rice IOP, we need to ask what caused this herpes zoster to manifest in that particular patient? Is it uncontrolled diabetes? Or is there some stressor elements like loss of night sleep? Or is the patient immunosuppressed? Or is he on long distance travel? And so many aggravating factors could have made that prob uh, problem to manifest in that particular index patient. So what set the stage for the problem to manifest in the index patient is crucial to proceed in a particular directional pathway. Sometimes it is also important to know the symptoms are in evolution. All the symptoms of the disease may not manifest at the first go. Uh, after the follow, when the patient comes back with the uh, man to report or during the follow, you may be uh, surprised to know that there are additional uh, histories that are available with the patient, which we need to pay special attention. So what is practical is, uh, as we need to club both the prospective and retrospective. We are not doing a dance India competition of between boys and girls. What we need to do is uh, take the best of both and apply both prospective as well as retrospective analysis in a real time practice. So uh, the question comes is, why pay so much attention to this uh, element of meticulous history taking? So in other words, we need to ask why, why not? not? Is my voice going? Please for him, doctor. Okay. You can carry on, doctor. Yeah. So uh, we need to ask why not? Uh, what happens if you do not follow this important element of medical history taking?
can you unmute yourself because we can't hear. No, no. Uh, yeah, it's moving forward. Yeah, just, mm -hmm. just... uh, is my uh, next slide visible? Yes, sir. Yeah. So we uh, the history taking has got a lot of relevance, starting from symptom analysis, going on to a particular etiological diagnosis. So different uh, system manifestations can be there of a particular disease. So that helps in reaching the etiology of the disease. More importantly, ruling out the differentials of the disease. And sometimes after we start a treatment, the patients may or may not follow the exact orders which we are given. The complaints check is very vital in doing a proper history taking. And uh, the correct treatment response can be ascertained only if all these factors are taken into account. And more importantly, as a clinician, if the patient has comorbidities like diabetic hypertensive or other multiple systemic medication like treatment for convulsions or anti-epileptics, there could be possible drug interaction which we need to factor in when you start the treatment. So the details of those uh, treatment is very vital to focus on this important element of drug interactions. And based on that, we need to pay attention to do some uh, dose alterations if there are overlapping medication. Uh, two days back, when I uh, came across a patient of uh, uh, systemic lupus erythematosus, the patient did not give the details of the systemic medication on the first visit. Actually, the patient was already on methylprednisolone 8 milligram, and I was about to add one more steroids. It would have been a catastrophe of the patient taking double the dosage of steroids. So uh, luckily, during follow-up, when I checked all the details, the patient is already on uh, systemic steroids, we can uh, politely tell the rheumatologist uh, to alter the dosage instead of giving double the dosage of steroids. So uh, the overlapping medications are an important element to factor in and uh, sometimes our treatment is ineffective because uh, uh, there could be so many variables in the compliance or uh, our etiological diagnosis or we could have not reached a, a correct therapeutic dose effect. All those things uh, has to be factored in. So we may modify the treatment if it is ineffective, before which we need to ask detailed history of all these elements to, uh, so that uh, we do and uh, we can even plan an additional investigations like polymerase chain reaction or a vitreous biopsy in non-responding cases. To do all this in a correct focused manner, detailed history taking is very, very crucial. So uh, the starting from symptom analysis, proceeding the correct possible treatment care, history taking has got very, very important role in all these domains when we take the treatment of the patient as a whole. So the diagnosis based only on history, uh, as we know that sympathetic ophthalmia and BKH are overlapping conditions except for history of trauma. All the uh, disease findings, symptoms or signs can be there in both the disease, except for the history of trauma. Similarly, uh, traumatic UHDs uh, can have overlapping presentation with the uh, UAT conditions uh, and endophthalmitis. So the diseases could be in evolution. What is considered endophthalmitis can initially start as UHDs. We need to pay special attention, focus our treatment care based on uh, the specific issues. More importantly, sometimes the masquerades like CSCR, central serous retinopathy, that could be the history of loss of sleep, type A personality, a patient is very anxious. Those are all important elements which could give us a clue uh, uh, to reach a correct diagnosis. We shall see all these examples throughout the course of the presentation. So I would say this history taking our anamnesis as a magnetic compass in the treatment care. It gives us a specific direction. Suppose in a prospective reproductive female uh, who is uh, planning to conceive, we need to be very, very careful uh, if the patient is already pregnant, uh, chest radiograms need to be avoided uh, because there could be a radiation exposure and it can become a medical legal issue as well. Sometimes the patient also do not know they are pregnant and uh, we need to be very, very careful in doing the imaging tests which are invasive like the FF fundus producing an angiogram and the angiogram and the green angiogram. So we need to uh, politely tell the patient that these are all invasive procedures and uh, so that we do the uh, procedure in a safer manner. Similarly, when you suspect a metallic foreign body, 
uh, you know that uh, the magnetic spin can infer uh, can interfere with the uh, movement of the foreign bodies or if there is a metallic processes in the teeth or anywhere in the systems uh, so we need to be very very careful when we order an urgent image uh, sometimes when there are drug allergies uh, the patient are, uh, already gone to another institute where the patient has developed anaphylaxis following furosin angiogram if the history is overlooked and the patient or patients attend there do not divulge it uh, sometimes we may end up in problem so be very very careful uh, with asking all these detailed fine nuances especially in re uh, patients who are uh, uh, come for second opinion from other institutes uh, sometimes uh, the beginners say that uh, this history taking is takes enormous amount of time so it takes minimum 20 to 30 minutes i agree so why do we actually uh, pursue with so much patience and uh, uh, perseverance uh, sometimes when there is history of drug allergy uh, we may be uh, tempted to give the bacterium ds as a, to a toxoplasma drug we have to be very careful in avoiding those sometimes uh, this was uh, another uh, very challenging case of the AA where uh, the patient developed severe osteopenia and as well as the fracture of the bones uh, this bilateral avascular necrosis of the femur is it uh, absolute contraindication to give oral steroids so the surprise of this condition is this condition can develop even at any dosage of steroids uh, it is uh, not dependent on the uh, higher dose or moderate dose so we have to be very very watchful in asking the history of any uh, hip trans hip replacement surgery done or if there is any history of uh, easy bone fractures so that we avoid steroids and consider a local uh, alternate treatment with steroids or immunosuppressants. Sometimes the history is also useful when we handle immunosuppressants. For example, in a patient on methotrexate, uh, this history of uh, uh, recurrent dry cough could act as a pointer to tell us whether the patient is having an interstitial lung disease, which is considered as a dose limiting side effect of methotrexate. So always pay, I always, whenever a patient on methotrexate comes back for review, uh, I definitely pay attention so that at least this minimum history of uh, recurrent dry cough is asked. Of course, there are so many conditions that cause dry cough, but it gives us a pointer so that we don't overlook those important entities. Sometimes the, uh, these are the era where we give a lot of biologicals, combined multiple immunosuppressives along with hydrosteroids. So we need to be very, very careful that because the risk of tuberculosis in endemic country like India is increased multifold. So the uh, learning which I got from all my uh, uh, mentors is that rule of tuberculosis at every visit. That means what? We need to be uh, very, very careful in asking the history relevant for tuberculosis, even though our original diagnosis is established because uh, they can get TB at any point of time during the follow. -up. So remember that we are still in uh, working in an Indian uh, environment where tuberculosis is super common. So sometimes people brand us that we are a tuberculosis maniac. Don't get uh, offended or feel sorry for that. Uh, we have to be very, very careful in ruling out tuberculosis. Half of the problem in UATS will be solved if we rule out two conditions, that is tuberculosis and syphilis. So uh, what are the uh, things we need to be very careful when we handle a follow-up patient of anti-tuberculous uh, drugs? That is, we need to pay attention to history of uh, side effects. We all know what all side effects, rifampicin can cause, INH, pyrostomitis, all basic pharmacology, which you have studied in UG. We need to apply them in your real-time practice as well as do a compliance check. Dr. Sudarshan used to uh, teach me that we need to ask whether there is a discoloration of the urine that acts as whether the patient has actually taken the drug or not. We need to also ask whether there is any altered perception of the color or if there is some defective uh, area in a particular quadrant of this field of vision, even from the history, even before we do a color vision and fields. Of course, the standard operating procedure now is any patient on ATT, we need to check this minimum color vision and fields during the follow-up to evaluate for the antitubocular toxicity. Now with the newer government regime, even this uh, ethambutal is going on in the continuation phase. So pay special attention to the color vision and the field anomalies that can happen with patients on anti-TB drugs. 
Uh, moreover, a uh, lot of our elderly patients have comorbidities. They may be taking the anti DM drugs, diabetes mellitus, anti hypertensives, or multiple cardiac medications. Uh, if we give them together, there can be a rise of blood sugar, blood pressure. We need to be very, very careful so that we communicate with the system physician to alter the dosing as well as, if feasible, we can consider an alternative if the sugar levels or BP levels are not coming down with the maximum possible medication from their end as well. So we need to uh, really establish a partnership, especially when we are dealing with UAT patients. So uh, as a clinician, uh, what are the histories we are going to ask at even at every follow-up? Yes, sir, there is history of evening rise of temperature, loss of weight, loss of appetite, night sweats, or blood with sputum associated with breathlessness, or more importantly, in a children or even elders, there is history of primary complex. We need to be very uh, careful in asking whether they have taken anti TB drugs for more than six months or so, or history of contact with tuberculosis in family members or in the working environment, whether there is overcrowding, whether they are working in a hostel and a crowded room, or if they have taken anti TB drugs, what is the duration in which they have taken? Is it incomplete treatment or complete treatment? Have they stopped the anti TB drugs themselves or on the advice of the physician? Uh, during the stoppage of anti TB drugs, whether any due documentation of full uh, resolution was established or not. All these are important because if, uh, those are going to make a lot of influence in our final plan of treatment. So during anti TB drugs, if there is any side effect experience, is also going to be important as a clinician. So sometimes uh, with the uh, coexistent HIV and TB, and uh, there could be a drug resistant TB in the family members. We need to be very, very careful because uh, if you are handling a, a multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, invariably one clue that comes is uh, the patient had one more contact of MDR patient and this environment, either due to incomplete ADT or in due, uh, uh, due to uh, improper follow. -up. So all these elements are really uh, relevant for tuberculosis. So going in depth for tuberculosis is very important as a UVA specialist. So I would like to highlight this important terminology uh, from this article uh, from Doug Jacks who propose whenever we do any complementary investigation, it needs to be guided by this pre-test probability of the etiology, the ophthalmic signs, the symptoms, and the therapeutic consequences. So all these wordings of this article really, really impress me so much that we need to follow that in our practice. Sometimes uh, what is followed in uh, Western countries is different from our Indian setup because the pre-test probability of the disease is different. The therapeutic consequences are going to be entirely different. So you need to be uh, adaptive to the changing environment of the disease entity. So uh, pay special attention to the pre-test probability of the disease entity in your local environment. So this is one another article which is recently published. Uh, as you can see, which says that uh, the medical history and the laboratory investigation should be tailored uh, based on the anatomic focus of the inflammation and the clinical picture. So uh, in the following uh, presentation, you will understand that how to uh, do a meticulous ocular examination based on that you can reach as granulomatous, non-granulomatous. Those are all going to influence the clinician. What are the history you are going to ask the patient? So, so that you can modify the relevant history during the retrospective anamnesis. So uh, let us go to the proper ocular history taking. So uh, this is a wonderful book. Uh, those who are interested can read the complete guide on ocular history taking. So uh, like in uh, medical or surgical uh, branches of uh, any uh, UG you would have seen, whenever the patient says any complaint, you start with the onset, how much is the duration of the disease, what is the course of the disease? Is it progressive, regressive, or is it recurrent too often? Laterality is more important. So uh, uh, without uh, writing uh, right eye, both uh, left eye, or both eyes, if it is both eye, right eye, more than left eye, or left eye, more than right eye, or right eye, equal to left eye, my teacher will never refuse me to present any case to her. So all these small, small things are so vital for a clinician. So painful is it, uh, the defective vision, is there an associated pain, there is an associated redness, or is there is no pain at all? 
are we dealing with a fugue entity where innovative happens in a white eye or if the patient has already taken steroids uh, how was the response to treatment was the symptoms subsiding or is it initially subsiding coming back again or what are the aggravating factors what are the relieving factors all these seven elements you can uh, insert in any of the patient's complaint and do a detailed history taking which will help us to proceed in a meticulous methodical uh, way so uh, i will skip uh, next two or three slides where dr patho has touched upon what are the uh, innovations of, uh, that can cause uh, a pain in the eye uh, you know that the trigeminal nerve is very important and that could be referred pain and the pain in scleritis is different from the uveitis so again uh, we all uh, because dr patho has already covered photophobia or redness could also happen we need to explain all this uh, complaints with the patient come up to our uh, practice again the blood vision and floaters are also important because whenever this floaters complaint happens it means uh, the io is mandatory there is an element of interpretive posterior segment involvement and uh, it could also happen in cystoid macular edema even we need to pay special attention to the sequel of the uv is as well uh, like cnbm er epiretinal membrane or the retinal ischemia coroidal neovascular membrane, all these could also influence this presenting complaint of the patient. Uh, as a UVA specialist, we also need to ask history relevant for glaucoma as well because UVAs can indirectly uh, cause a raised or a decreased IOP. For example, a typical condition of raised IOP will be a viral enteritis like herpes simplex, zoster or postnus and even toxic can cause trabeculitis and raised IOP. All these, uh, it should come reflexively to the clinician uh, whether there are associated history pertaining uh, to an EVATS with raised IOP. So, uh, this is a basic uh, anatomical classification. Most of you might know any EVATS is going to be classified as anterior or intermediate or posterior, and the pan EVATS has equal involvement. The word equal by sun classification is important. Of the, all the three segments are equally involved in an untreated eye. So, uh, sometimes patients come to us following partial treatment, then the uh, anterior segment inflammation could partially come down, whereas the posterior segment may not come down with the topical steroid given elsewhere. So, all these elements have to be factored in. Before branding, the clinical diagnosis as pan is or posterior is because the set of differentials is going to vary uh, when we have a set of differentials as pan is we have a particular list, whereas for the posterior is we have an entirely different list. So, summarizing from the history is very important. Uh, so, uh, as I said, that anti uv is typically present with pain, photophobia, redness. Uh, we, uh, invariably, there could be an associated anti segment involvement. Intermediate uv is typically has floaters, flashes, and defective vision. Uh, post uv is associated with floaters, photophobia, scotomas, decreased vision. All these are elements. To, uh, uh, for a clinician to pick uh, to uh, localize the problem in the posterior uveitis. So sometimes when there is pan uveitis, we'll have all the three uh, set of symptoms and we need to pay special attention to put things together. So sometimes an interesting thing which I uh, came across uh, in the practice is the patient still complains of defective vision, even though there is 20 by 20 vision and snell and chart. So, what we do in that uh, scenario is, or is the patient having a defective field defect, or is there a scotoma, or the patient telling about the defective color vision, or is it a metamorphosia, or if there is a uh, problem in the contrast sensitivity. So, we need to evaluate probe with detailed history in, uh, before ordering test for each of them, because a particular test for field is, uh, defect is going to take enormous amount of time, whereas a contrast sensitivity test is going to be entirely different. So, uh, history taking can help the clinician to order the next appropriate uh, investigations and you can corroborate the history as well as the finding to uh, go in a particular direction for a specific test. So, uh, we should not be perplexed when we have a, a patient saying defective vision. Whenever the patient says defective vision in 6-6, Sometimes we say that the patient is uh, uh, simply saying uh, to get attention. But I, uh, what I learned is uh, we need to uh, understand the language. There could be language barriers. Uh, what they are trying to describe as defective vision, that will give us wonderful clue 
to reach the diagnosis. Suppose there is a macular choroidopathy, there is a subtle mutes lesion, or there is a, a subtle azure lesion. This is going to come up initially with scotomas or metamorphosia, even though the patient may have six by six vision. So the patient would have visited several hospitals where they have just discarded the patient that you don't have any problem. So be very, very careful in attending those sort of patients in your uh, practice and treatment care. Uh, uh, this, uh, the symptomatology, uh, we go in a stepwise fashion in the following slides. Uh, uh, the demographics is also important. So like the demographics include age, gender, race, geography of the patient, what sort of occupation the patient is uh, undertaking and the socioeconomic status. Let us see in the following slides. Uh, so the clinical entities uh, varies with the different age group. For example, in children, you are going to have uh, JRE or uh, uh, toxocariasis or masquerades or retinoblastoma. Whereas in young adults, past planetaries or multiple sclerosis, fuchs is uh, invariably common. Middle age, uh, apart from the actually B27 entities, uh, the post is like VKH, Bessets, APMPP are going to be uh, common. Whereas in a very, very elderly, beyond 60 years, uh, malignancies like lymphoma, melanoma, endogenous adoptal medicine following uncontrolled diabetes or any trauma causes or masquerades are uh, super common. So age is also important filter to rule out or rule in a particular set of differential diagnosis. So uh, once we understand this important element, uh, our job becomes much easier. So, uh, the, uh, how relevant is uh, the sex in uh, evaluation of the history is, uh, we know that uh, males are more predisposed to trauma. Uh, I don't want to get into the reason for that. And uh, so, the sympathetic ophthalmitis is so common in uh, male. Similarly, basics and ankylosing spondylitis is common in male. Whereas, the most autoimmune conditions, uh, like systemic lupus erythematosus are common in females, sarcoidosis also is common in females, whereas reters, JRA or, or rheumatoid arthritis is going to be uh, common in females. So this is also important. Suppose you have a JRA patient who is male, you are diagnosing. So that becomes a poor prognostic factor and your uh, plan of treatment is going to be a little different uh, because it is one of the poor prognosticator. It doesn't mean that JRA cannot happen in male. So one, you know that a particular disease uh, fits in a particular sex and age group, and if there is some atypicality, you will plan a particular type of treatment pertaining to the situation. So uveitis is one unique disease that varies with geography. For example, in Caucasians, ankylosing spondylitis retus is common. In pigmented age, uh, races, like including Asians, uh, we can see a lot of uh, Okoinagi Harada disease. Whereas Bessers is common in Orientals. Why we are telling all this? Because in this uh, modern age, people travel from one continent to another continent, and uh, 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 there could be a patient who is uh, for medical tourism comes to a, a different part of the world, and we need to pay attention uh, so to what sort of uveitic entities you are trying to handle in that scenario. So uh, let me give an example. Suppose you have a uh, bilateral correlated scar, perivascular pigmented uh, in a Southeast Asia and India, your differentials is going to be in most commonly tuberculosis, sometimes toxoplasma or viral. So the configuration of scar is going to be different in all the three. Uh, whereas the same entity, the bilateral correlated scar, perivascular in location, if it is in the sub-Saharan Africa, uh, you will most commonly encounter an oncocerciasis. Uh, uh, you will not entertain a tuberculosis there because uh, the geography of the patient is different. So uh, this is very important uh, point to uh, grasp whenever we reach the clinical diagnosis. Uh, I will uh, emphasize my young student friends, whenever we learn anything in ophthalmology, we need to think opposite. Uh, so this was uh, one person like uh, Fosbury who predicted a reverse uh, jumping and won medal when everybody was doing a direct jumping. So uh, what I mean to say is uh, we need to learn like which disease is seldom seen in India. We are telling that tuberculosis is common in India. Which disease is never, never or very rarely seen in India. Uh, uh, 
that should arouse an interest to the uh, learning um, student to remember those entities because we will not keep them as a first differential diagnosis. The answer is birdshot chorioretinopathy is very, very rarely seen in Indian subcontinent uh, because people, we learn from Kansky and all the books written by the Westerners and where they say that uh, the post weight is uh, you, uh, like a uh, lot of white dot syndromes as well as uh, the uh, birdshot chorioretinopathy, we rarely come across in Indian setup. Whereas in Europe and US, will entertain a lot of birds. In fact, when I went to US, uh, there was a lot of patients in a particular day with birdshot with on immunosuppressives, uh, with a similar picture like what we see in uh, other disease entities in our Indian setup. So the geography is going to be very important to reach their clinical diagnosis. Race is also important. As we said that uh, uh, the, in the yellow slide, we have already discussed that ankylosing spondylitis, reters, or other variants uh, are common in the white population, whereas blacks have a predisposition to get an aggressive form of sarcoidosis. Uh, yeah, in the Asian population, including the Japanese, uh, weak age is very common compared to the and behaves differently compared to the non Asians. And you will understand that uh, the treatment protocol is little different. Uh, on when to start immunosuppression in Japanese population compared to the uh, US population. In Mediterranean countries, basis, which has uh, a tendency to follow the silk route uh, uh, is very common. So the geography, the location is also important. As I said that basis, uh, there is an ancient silk route uh, going across the continents and uh, like Turkey, Japan, and uh, there is a, a linkage for these uh, haplotypes, Hachalia associations. We know that uh, the, the Hachalia B51, B52 uh, have a higher tendency or predisposition to develop this basic disease. And uh, the geography location has got an important uh, variable to uh, diagnose the correct disease entities. Sometimes the patient could come from the Middle East or their ancestors could come from Pakistan or the middle part of Asia and uh, uh, we need to be very, very careful. Whenever uh, this basic patient, uh, I keep in the diagnosis, I go to the ancestors, whether three, four, five generations before they uh, travel along the Mediterranean uh, silk route. So this could help us to strengthen uh, whether our diagnosis is really correct. Uh, are we going on the correct track or not? Because uh, ordering for actually B51, B52 uh, is not without its false positive and false negativity as well. So we need to correlate things clinically before uh, uh, and for which the pretest probability is very important. So uh, in a developing country, tuberculosis is common, whereas in river, uh, Missouri river valleys, we have this histoplasma, which is very rarely seen in Indian country. This coccyoidosis is, is again common in Americas, uh, North America, as well as the South America. As I said, U.S. birdshot, Lyme is against U.S. very rarely in southern part of India. Uh, we said the basics about the silk route. The socioeconomic history is again relevant for UATs because uh, in, uh, infectious diseases are known to affect people with lower socioeconomic status because overcrowding is common, poor hygiene, lack of sanitation and soil pollution all influence the spread of the infection. So uh, even uh, for a trematode infection in Leptospira, uh, swimming in dirty and brackish water, contaminated water are all important elements uh, to correlate the socioeconomic status of the population, uh, the patient whom we are dealing with. What are the diseases where the parasitology is going to matter? We all know that toxoplasma has got a direct history of contact with cats, there is uh, contact with dogs, with toxocariasis, uh, the other cattle, like uh, sheep or goats, uh, as a direct relation with uh, leptospirosis and cysticercosis. Pigs has got um, uh, history of contact with pig is very important for cysticercosis and leptospirosis. History of contact with snail uh, is very, very relevant for trematode induced granuloma, uh, as uh, we shall describe in the illustration in the next part of the presentation. The treatment history is also very important. Uh, whenever the patient is uh, already treated elsewhere, what is the dosage of the drug, how long have we been taking, the side effect they have experienced, whether they are responding or not, if they are already an anti-toxin, whether there was a response to treatment or not, 
how much was uh, what was the number of recurrences that has happened in the last six months or last one year how are they compliant with the medicine given all this has to be meticulously documented when you go into the treatment history the systemic history uh, for UVATs is very very exhaustive sometimes this is a part of the history which really makes the student to fail uh, so many histories we have to ask so because the other part of history may have overlap with other conditions like glaucoma or other uh, uh, medical ophthalmology conditions whereas the systemic evaluation is very very relevant we will go in an orderly fashion starting with head and neck cns ent pulmonary histories gastrointestinal genitourinary dermatological uh, skin uh, and musculoskeletal and the constitutional symptoms not to forget the last so uh, the cns symptoms which we need to pay attention are is the patient having severe frequent headache is a thunder clap in character uh, could it point towards uh, uh, temporal arteritis or any uh, cns vasculitis or if there could be a cns toxoplasma causing a raised uh, intracranial pressure are there history of uh, frequent fainting attacks or uh, is there numbness tingling in the body relevant to multiple sclerosis weakness paralysis of the body uh, when we deal with masquerades or there could be a space of lesion that could be associated with the uveitis like history of seizures convulsions etc all this history relevant to cns uh, is very uh, important in uveitis history taking so example headache could commonly happen in vkh sarcoid or tuberculosis herpes or ophthalmitis is frequently associated with the neurologic severe pain and uh, lancinating in character and we need to be pay attention to the uh, to treat the neurologic part of the herpes zoster as well. Uh, PAM uh, uh, can again have severe form of arteritic headache, toxoplasma, as I said, libraries uh, again can have associated CNS symptoms, large cell lymphoma or other CNS lymphomas, masquerades can have a severe form of headache. So uh, the starting from common to uncommon entities, we need to entertain the possibilities, even a minor complaint like headache is very relevant in UVITs. Cranial neuropathies, sometimes we need to think in terms of Lyme, sarcoidosis, multiple sclerosis, syphilis, as well as the uh, trivial viral infections like HSV or uh, VZV. So, the cranial neuropathy, apart from CNS, uh, needs to be uh, paid special attention. Sometimes, uh, in the CNS symptom, the patient could experience psychotic symptoms. Sometimes when a patient walks in brisk and it's difficult to ask whether they are having psychotic symptoms and the help of the attender should be sought. Sometimes weak patient can have in the prodromal phase uh, sort of uh, uh, CNS symptoms, psychosis and uh, basics can have CNS involvement. SLE is known to have CNS involvement. Sometimes drug induced uh, psychosis can happen uh, along with uh, CNS sarcoidosis as well. So, uh, psychosis is one funny symptom which we need to be very, very uh, delicate and careful in eliciting a detailed history. Why? Because our steroid is again to cause, known to cause more of uh, psychosis as a side effect. We need to explain the patient that uh, all this has to be factored in while doing a meticulous care uh, for the treatment. History of cerebral vasculitis can have association with the, when uh, we diagnose this, uh, vasculitis in, in the retina, like uh, Bessette's vasculitis, or uh, when you have a diagnosis of APMPP, zoster simplex virus infections, syphilis can have CNS. Uh, any ocular syphilis, we know that is going to be associated definitely with CNS syphilis. It has to be carefully ruled out with the CS of TAP. Lyme's disease can have CNS involvement. So, we need to partner with the uh, neurologist. Uh, so that we give a holistic treatment care and not only treat only the eye as uh, alone we need to uh, treat the patient as a whole so uh, sometimes even though we are ophthalmologists our sister branch ent is uh, also important sometimes the uh, ear symptoms like hard of hearing or deafness ringing sensation can happen in bkh frequent or severe ear infections can happen when they have a, a uh, uh, decreased immunity or painful or swollen ear lobes can have happen in uh, uh, relapsing polycarangritis or Hansen's disease as well. Uh, nose and throat symptoms like sores in the nose are also relevant. Frequent or severe nose bleed is important for uh, uh, vaginous granulomatosis, uh, recently called as GPA. 
frequent sneezing, sinus infection is relevant for tuberculosis as well as uh, GPA. Uh, persistent hoarseness of the voice could have associated uh, cranial nerve involvement in sarcoidosis or uh, other CNS associated uh, uveitic entities which you have described. Tooth or gum infections are relevant when we are suspecting endogenous endophthalmitis. All these ear and nose and throat infections are, are uh, very pertinent when we deal with ocular condition as well. Shifting gears, the respiratory symptom was super important because tuberculosis is the most uh, uh, important disease which we are going to rule out. Frequent or severe colds, constant cough, blood in the sputum, frequent or uh, re recently post COVID vaccination induced uveitis is so common. So, whether the uveitic entity has got any temporal relationship following the uh, vaccination, whether the first super, uh, booster dose or the third booster dose has got special. Uh, mentioned to be captured uh, or there is history of wheezing, asthma because the drugs which you are going to give is going to influence the treatment for it or there could be associated pneumoconiosis as well. Difficulty in breathing can also influence because there could be uh, tuberculosis, sarcoidosis, other uh, conditions which could influence the treatment of uh, the particular disease entities like uh, uh, cardiomyopathy can have difficult breathing, all these elements could be uh, influencing the final treatment pathway. The genitourinary is very important uh, because th there could be renal problems, bladder problems associated with the patient, uh, blood in the urine or urinary discharge, genital sores or the ulcers, retus is very important, prostatitis, there could be tuberculosis associated with prostatitis, uh, testicular pain, epididymitis are all relevant when we evaluate the ocular condition. So, so, in fact, Dr. Amur sir will uh, recollect that in his first uh, uh, documentation, they identified tubercular bacilli from the uh, epididymis to prove that the same patient had uh, improvement of the epididymitis as well as the ocular involvement of tuberculosis in the ATT. So, co correlating the history is very important to prove uh, the disease entity so that uh, we go in a particular direction. So the most important thing is, uh, which we uh, forget, especially when we handle female patient in the middle age group is, uh, patients are not aware or we uh, don't pay attention whether they are already pregnant because uh, certain drugs like sulfur drugs for toxoplasma is going to be contraindicated in a particular trimester of the pregnancy or even a steroids is going to be determined in a particular trimester of the pregnancy, delay the closure of the patent ductus arteriosus. Uh, so, the dosage has to be moderated or we need to establish partnership with the concerned specialist. Or in the patient planning to be pregnant, this is very important history when we uh, plan to start the patient on immunosuppressors, especially in females like VKH. So, uh, uh, get a clear-cut consent. Are they going to get uh, pregnant uh, in a short period of time? Are they planning to get married? So, we need to stop the immunosuppressors six months before the planned uh, pregnancy. So all these elements has to be factored in. The key element from the history is going to give a dramatic change in the treatment approach. So uh, to summarize, the genital ulcers are relevant in Bessels, Reiters, Syphilis. Hamachuria, if they ask in exam, we need to uh, remember that Veginus, PAN, SLE are going to be relevant there. Sarcinic balanitis in Anki and Reiters. Urethral discharge is going to be relevant in Syphilis and Reiters. So uh, the dendrite in the system, although it is very dicey to ask the patient, uh, especially uh, when there is gender difference between the clinician and the patient, we need to get the help of the paramedical person to ask the relevant history. Shifting gears, uh, the dermatological system is also important for uveitis, starting from rashes anywhere in the body, uh, skin sores, whether the patient has a tendency to get sunburns relevant for SLE, DLE, or white patches of the skin or hair are relevant to uh, uh, VKH, loss of hair, uh, alopecia are relevant to uh, psoriasis as well as SLE. Ticks or insect bites is most often forgotten and overlooked when we uh, deal with uh, emerging virus infections. Painful cold finger like renal phenomena are important when we deal with the vasculitis. Severe itching uh, could give us a clue whether there is a parasitosis anywhere in the body. So all these clues from the skin symptoms, uh, the history is very easy to take and rather than breaking your head, finally, 
uh, are we dealing with uh, parasitic disease or is a non infectious disease if the uh, history taking is meticulously done our job becomes much much simpler so uh, again to recap uh, the alopecia is relevant for vk age syphilis vitiligo poliosis for vk age you will agree that nodules are relevant for sarcoid sle lepra can have lepra nodules ulcerative crohn's also known to have skin nodules a rashes in the body would be relevant uh, in stds like syphilis or uh, uh, reuters limes leprosy sarcoidosis and uh, herpes zoster virus can have skin rashes in the dermatological distribution basic psoriasis sle even kawasaki disease can have subtle rashes uh, that we need to uh, clearly uh, look for keratoma bronchitis is one skin condition which is associated with the reuters and ankylosing spondylitis so be very very uh, careful uh, such that we don't overlook all these subtle uh, skin histories uh, so that the relevant diagnosis is properly established see uh, as a uva specialist the one important organ system which i should never ever uh, overlook is bone and joint i'll tell you why uh, so history of uh, stiff joints painful swollen joints uh, history of stiff low back back pain or sleeping or awakening muscle aches are all relevant to see if there is a, a, re a relevant association with hachili b27 ankylosing spondylitis or in the uh, steroid induced uh, bone related problems contraindications are there or not so arthralgia arthritis could happen in basics sarcoidosis sle ja uh even an infection disease like limes and syphilis uh, and pre is a pneumonic or psoriatic arthritis uh, uh ankylosing spondylitis reuters and enteropathy that stands for this hachili b27 entities enteropathic arthritis includes ulcerative crohn's so uh, all this relevant history for arthralgia arthritis is very important whereas when the exam they are going to ask you most often what is the uh, one particular test you will do for hachili b27 uh, we should not hesitate to say that it is to rule out the sacroiliitis with the x ray or mri because once the sacroiliitis is there it is going to be a diagnostic predictor of the poor outcome and uh, high, uh, high dose immunosuppressors are indicated along with the consultation of the rheumatologist so it can also happen in readers and other inflammatory bowel disease as well so uh, the Yeah, when we have one particular complaint, it doesn't mean it is always anki. So there could be the differential as well. So in UVA days, we are shameless to have a set of differentials. Whereas in uh, medical retina or in other branches, they are mostly sure iris PDR. This is iris PDR. There is no differential for iris PDR. Whereas for UVA days, we always have a set of differentials. So sometimes we shamelessly change the diagnosis, telling that the disease is in evolution. so such is the dynamicity of the disease and that is not a license for us to overlook all these subtle histories and the complex and the constitutional symptoms are very relevant uh, this is most often neglected for example history of fever is relevant for reuters basics uh, pan uh, inflammatory bowel disease or even in a patient with hiv they could have a fever with att as well as antiretro drugs uh, following att the patient could have an exacerbation of the constitutional symptoms night sweats in addition to tuberculosis can happen in malignancy sarcoidosis and coccidiomycosis flu like symptoms uh, is a particular thing which we need to be uh, very very careful uh, to ask whether there was a, a flu like viral illness antecedent to the onset of the eye problem that happens most often in apmpp and mumps Uh, recently last week uh, we had a patient of mules where uh, the uh, flu like symptoms uh, following this uh, winter here uh, we uh, encounter a lot of uh, posterior uveitic entities so a uh, family history is also relevant uh, this is just the running family apart from uveitis like uh, uh, you have to pay attention to familial diabetes family history of hypertension or there could be history of tuberculosis allergies or arthritis uh, sexually transmitted diseases or even sickle cell disease limes gouts could be there in the differentials so family history uh, whether the father mother any of their uh, relatives anywhere in the family and all this uh, family uh, history of uh, systemic condition that merits long term treatment with uh, 
uh, multiple medications covering all these has to be kept in a note. So social history is also relevant. Apart from the place of birth, uh, the smoking history, uh, we need to pay attention whether there is active smoking or passive smoking and based on which we can calculate the smoking index, uh, like the number of cigarettes smoked into the duration of smoking, which has got an influence to determine the final outcome. So a lot of our vascular disease patients, a lot of patients with the recurrent cystic macular edema, uh, uh, they, uh, if you ask why the uh, entities is recurring, if you ask at least this history of history of smoking cigarettes, and if you can convince the patient to stop smoking, your recurrence is going to come down uh, by uh, uh, multifold if uh, uh, the patient uh, listens to our advice. So smoking is invariably forgotten. We pay our attention whether to give the next line of intravitreal drugs or a combo drug with anti-VGF or we'll give intravitreal immunosuppressive. We never ask whether the patient is uh, smoking cigarette or not. So next time, be very careful uh, not to miss this history of smoking. And the uh, history of alcoholism is very important because uh, the patient on immunosuppressive like methotrexate is going to be metabolized by the liver and there could be uh, alcohol-induced uh, liver damage. It's going to compound the problem. We need to specially tell them when uh, in the consent form that to not to take alcohol whenever the methotrexate is given. Yeah, not only methotrexate, anti-TB drugs or even the other drugs that are metabolized by the liver is uh, we need to pay special attention. So, what job are they going? Are they doing? Like, uh, for example, uh, butchers, uh, they could have a toxoplasma or uh, leptospirosis uh, commonly associated. Uh, travel history is relevant whether they have gone to uh, travel into forest, you may uh, uh, encounter the emerging viral infections like rickettsia, rashes, all those could be there. Dietary patterns are relevant. We see a non-vegetarian diet or pure vegetarian diet is very important to uh, filter out the diagnosis. Of course, we cannot definitely say, but uh, uh, these are all uh, pointers which could strengthen the pre-test probability. Again, the sexual behavior is very important when we deal with uh, uh, syphilis or uh, the other uh, uh, readers, other uh, uh, diseases which you have already covered, which could have genitourinary involvement. Tick bites is something very subtle, which is easily overlooked, which we need to be very, very careful not to overlook. So, the, uh, in my practice, uh, this one particular history has been a phase seven. Uh, what is that? That is, uh, if I miss a lot of histories, I ask one history at the end of the, my history taking. That is, uh, do you want to divulge any other uh, medical condition for which you are admitted and treated? If you ask this particular question, invariably the patient will come up with uh, another file. They will say that they have kept outside, they will bring the next visit. Something, something they will start adding on. Uh, why is it important? Because if you forget to take or if you overlook some of the history and uh, the patient uh, this is the age where they go for medical jurisprudence, at least you can say that I have asked this question and uh, all this uh, uh, you, you did not divulge or uh, we did not pay, uh, you did not have the correct details, all this could act as a phase saver. Uh, suppose uh, the diagnosis is incorrectly established. So have a phase saver as a clinician. So post-COVID, we have to be very careful in giving high-dose steroids, whether they have a long COVID, prolonged hospitalization in the ICU. All these are going to be important. History of jaundice, especially in patients on ATT, history of uh, uh, immunization in children. Suppose we have a macular ret uh, retinitis and you are going to diagnose measles associated SSPE. Invariably, uh, you will get a history that the patient has missed the MMR vaccine or measles vaccine. So this is one important history that is going to solve much of the puzzle. So, uh, so the history taking is a phase saver for a clinician. If you have a final set of differential uh, history, you keep it as a reserve. When all the history is uh, coming negative, you uh, start asking these uh, uh, leading questions, you may invariably come up with some face saver. So, as I said, I'll uh, cover some of the general examination pointers, like uh, there could be, uh, when you do a, a general examination, there could be pinna, 
uh, involvement like relapsing polychondritis, saddle proof deformities, sinusitis, uh, salivary lacrimal gland swelling, lymphadenopathy. Uh, uh, Amit, overshooting my time, please let me know. Yes, sir. So we generally wrap up by nine. So if you can uh, have a few minutes for the questions, that will be great. Okay. So uh, the, the next uh, subsequent part of my presentation is going to be illustrations uh, in my practice, how uh, this uh, history taking has made a lot of differences uh, due to lack of time. I will skip the subsequent part of my presentation. This is the part B. Uh, uh, Sorry for being elaborative in the first part. Uh, so I will be grateful uh, if there are some questions from the audiences. Thank you so much, sir. I think a very difficult topic to cover because there's so much to discuss in the history taking, which is the most important step for the diagnosis. I'll, uh, without further ado, I think I request Abhilasha Ma'am and Patupratim sir to uh, kickstart the questions that we have on the social media portals so that our viewers can benefit from that. I, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Bala, for such an extensive coverage of the most important part of the uveitis management. I think, <clears throat> the, as uh, William Osler said, no, the listen to your patient is telling you the diagnosis. So uh, we'll take some questions. I think Professor uh, Gupta is also here. So first question, <clears throat> I think, from the uh, postgraduate. So in our exam, when we have limited time for history taking and we come across a long history, uh, what are the pointers we should be uh, should not be missing, sir? Are you there? You are asking me. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, if I have to uh, deal with this history taking, uh, I think there is a change in uh, what Bala has been discussing is a very very comprehensive overview of all the historical aspects uh, in relation to uveitis or you could review all the systems and you could review all the symptomatology and possible signs. And somewhere you'll find that, well, patient may have a component of uveitis. So what we need to, instead of look, you know, from without in, rather than look at all the systems and all the possible symptomatology across the body, we look at the eye first. So what we do is after a preliminary hello and asking the patient what brought him to you, you know, and whether the patient, how long he has been sick and whether yeah, just a preliminary examination. And then you get back to the, get the patient on the slit lamp after recording your vision and pressure and all, and you examine and localize inflammation. Where is it localized? What it, does it look like? Does it look like acute, subacute? Does it look like a chronic inflammation? Is it localized in anterior segment? You know, uh, is it? So you, what we call, this is what we call as a targeted history taking. Okay. So when we take a targeted history, you know, uh, it already, uh, you know, uh, you are having in mind whether answer to your question is going to give a yes or a no. So whenever we are asking a symptom, we are asking a history, it must add or, you know, minus from your uh, algorithm that you are trying to create for your patient. So asking, let's say, travel history from a patient of, say, who's come with acute pain and redness in the eye, may not be relevant. You have to ask him whether does he get morning stiffness or a back, lower back stiffness, you know. So something like when you see a hypopion or if you see a high pressure, you are not going to be asking all the questions relating to uh, the rest of the body. So you are going to ask very sharp questions, very pointed questions relating to that particular sign. So like if you see a mutton fat KP, now your questions are going to be related to something which looks like a granulomatous UVHS. A granulomatous KP is not consistent with, say, ankylosing spondylitis or with the Bashir's disease. On the other hand, you see a hypopion, which is mobile. First question you're going to ask is about a Bashir's disease, a GI disturbance or arthritis or, you know, a dermal uh, uh, or oral ulceration or genital ulceration. So you are going to, you know, tick boxes for a mobile hypopion or for a fibrinous hypopion, you're going to ask history around that. So 
what is called targeted history is my approach to asking questions that saves time and the patients you know patient like to spend time with the doctors they don't have time anywhere in the world as much time as they would like to spend okay so if you are going to be precise you are going to reach your diagnosis and differential very quickly because you need to maybe order lab maybe you not need to order labs okay now what is happening on the other hand despite all the big overview of the symptomatology which bala has just touched upon actually uh, people are in a great hurry to write a prescription so what, what i have seen is that prescription writing is the main objective of the ophthalmologist when they see a patient with uveitis and they want to get rid of that fellow so quickly without making a differential diagnosis so if you look at their prescription charts or the cards or the slips they carry it doesn't make any sense what he was thinking it doesn't reveal his thinking of the differential diagnosis so that is my approach i would call it a targeted approach to a history taking and ordering investigations or looking at the systems you know uh, so that you have a very precise information which will help you reaching a diagnosis thank you sir so the next question is on clinical science so that will be uh, discussing the next uh, uh, next day i am means i i think all of us are looking forward to it so yeah. another important question in a patient with history of episodes of red eye with spontaneous resolution now complaining of seeing ghost images how do you proceed ruling out the causes from the same i think uh, i think all will be covered in the clinical signs only so there is a interesting question from the dr aditya patil from narayan netralaya so are there any tips or tricks on the history taking to determine whether a patient who is on long term immunosuppression uh, is actually compliant with it i think he meant uh, this immunomodulation therapy so can you answer this question sir yeah <clears throat> what are the tips and tricks to know the compliance and uh, i can only tell you that we uh, the children i think uh, particularly uh, if the parents are not uh, overseeing the administration of the drugs uh, it can be uh, they can play tricks on you and uh, i still remember a young child i think he must be a grown man now himself a parent uh, when he was having a intermediate uveitis and i put him on uh, you know uh, immunomodulatory therapy and no matter how much i increase the dose he would not respond and the fellow uh, used to get nausea and then he would you know either throw up and not swallow the tablet because the mother was no mom was not uh, overlooking the the administration of that tablet so i think uh, for children you have to be very careful because there that's where the compliance is and uh, even for adults uh, you have to make sure because many a times the patients start taking a couple of days before their next visit to the doctor and in between they'll say they'll feel better and uh, they will feel good and they'll stop the steroids because uh, because on the advice of the neighbors uh, my symptoms are not resolved i am all right happy and then suddenly they stop because the patient and they'll come and say well i got all right and that's how i stopped and now the disease come back so you know those are the issues of compliance and the more you explain why you are giving the treatment what is the purpose of the treatment and why it is important to take on a regular basis uh, you know uh so it depends upon how how you communicate with the patient otherwise it remains a major major issue for all chronic diseases for diabetes for hypertension for heart diseases you know uh and so is for uveitis and particularly about steroids and immunomodulatory therapy uh, which would have any amount of side effects you know or unpleasant drugs people don't like to swallow those you know thank you thank you sir i think that's it
So thank you so much, everyone, and especially Dr. Bala sir for such an elaborate talk on a very very important topic. I think all of us have overstayed our dinner time, but totally worth it because this is the most important part of uh, our uh, examination and dealing with the patients. Uh, so next we meet on uh, coming Wednesday, which is December 14th, which is uh, going to be a talk by none other than Professor Amod Gupta sir himself, which is clinical science in uveitis. So requesting all the PGs to join in because I think uh, it's a very important topic and uh, I'm sure you are all are going to get benefited from it. Also, um, I would quickly like to announce about the physical eye focus, which is back after the COVID era, and it will be there from February 26 to March 5th in New Delhi, and registrations are still open. So requesting you all to kindly register and uh, be there. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, well, thank you very much, Bala, Partho, Shali, everybody. Welcome. See you next week. We are uh, waiting for you. Thank bye. You. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank you, Bala, sir. Thank you. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the cooperation. Thank you, sir. Bye. Good night. Bye. Thank, thank you, you sir.